Kingsley Benadire, you star in Bob Marley, One Love, as the reggae legend himself. Uh, now, this came not long after you played another significant historical figure, Malcolm X, in One Night in Miami, and you also played Barack Obama in The Comey Rule. Uh, was there trepidation in tackling another real-life figure? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, uh, it was the, it was the amount of new things that I was going to have to get a hold of and day one can feel a little bit overwhelming because you have to really look at the time that you have how many hours each thing's going to need and you kind of have to get on with it in a way where there's not much time to to break um but I was also up for the challenge and after I met Ziggy and I spoke to the family and I I really felt like I couldn't walk away from it it was too incredible an opportunity um, but pressure it's funny because I've had a little bit of time to reflect on it and also when the film's coming out and people were asking me about pressure I'm also still under pressure because we're waiting to see if the film's gonna do well and if people are gonna like it but now I feel kind of I feel in a really different space and I my honest answer to that question is I look back and I go yeah and you kind of want all you kind of want all jobs to feel in some way, shape or form like that. They need to feel dangerous and like you're doing something that feels kind of impossible and needs a lot of kind of giving over of yourself and, and, and playing Bob was that. And you look back and you guys really lucky to have that because you don't get that that often. Um, and Malcolm was the same. It's, they feel really dangerous. There's so many people who are so attached to these icons um, these icons. I mean, Malcolm and Bob, in my um, experience, they're loved, you know, they mean so much to so many people for different reasons. And so there's a huge responsibility, but there's a huge privilege to it as well. Um, pressure, is a, pressure is a privilege. Uh, and with the Marley family being involved uh, as producers of the film, like, what was that like? Did you get to spend a lot of time with them, yeah. uh, you know, before and during production? Yes, I did. I, 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 as soon as I put my first self-tape forwards, Ziggy had kind of approved it and the family had seen it and they asked to for me to fly out, spend time with Stephen and Ryan and, you know, other friends and family in, in Miami and then Ziggy in LA, and then eventually going down to Jamaica and meeting a lot of Bob's friends and members of the band, and it was ongoing. It was, there, were, there were conversations with the family and friends and people who knew Bob all the way through to the end. On set, everywhere, they were everywhere. Neville Garrick was with us every day. Um, Neville Garrick, who was on the Exodus tour with Bob and lived in the house, and wrote down the songs as Bob composed them in the bedroom in a notebook, was in the room with me when we were composing the songs and trying to figure them out. It was really mind blowing. Like he was with us every day on set. He didn't get to see the film, unfortunately, he passed away just before it came out. But I look back and I go like, what was that? That was like a dream, you know? There is no film, there is no film without the family. You know, so many scenes we got to the bottom of because Neville was there, um, because of the Jamaican language team who was there every day, tweaking, touching, making sure the authenticity was so specific that Bob was written in a way that was true to him and how he spoke regardless of who understands or who doesn't. Um, the sort of the, the communal effort to make authenticity the most important thing uh, was the, the such a huge part of the process and um yeah and uh you, you know you mentioned you're uh learning a lot of things to play this role um you know you're you're, you're adopting an accent you're learning that physicality on stage of course there's the musical aspect uh which would you say was the most challenging aspect to uh to get into character the patois yeah, it's a different language. You could live in Jamaica for 12 years. You know, you have to live there for that long. To un There's a version of the film where you don't understand anything they're saying to each other. So it's really it was mind-blowing. You know, I spent months and months transcribing 
all of Bob in all of Bob's interviews and you know a lot of interviews that the family sent me that only they have so sort of unreleased recorded footage of Bob in conversation with people over many many years I got those early on I started listening to them realized that I needed a lot of help and the Jamaican community from where I come from started coming over to my apartment helped me break them down we transcribed them, we translated them. They were eventually broken down into a language that's Cassidy, which is a, a kind of um, a phonetic patois uh, language. And so I had, my script was written in that language. And so I got to learn it through Cassidy. Um, it was ongoing until the end. You know, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a morning rehearsal where we didn't have a huge discussion about the language. Every night when we rapped, the discussions about the text were going on through the night, changes, script changes, tweaks and um, tweaks and changes to how Bob would say something. I had a repertoire of, you know, hundreds of pages of Bob's speak memorized. So I was able to contribute as well to how Bob might express himself in a certain situation, how when he was in this mood, he would kind of say this. When he didn't want to be understood, he would speak like this. If he was being clear for a European journalist, he would speak like this. When he was in the studio, he would speak like this. When he was rehearsing songs, is, you know, so we were able to keep that conversation going throughout the film. There was never a day where I woke up and went, now I'm here, now I got it. It was always figuring out tiny details that when they all come together, the, the, the feel of the culture in the movie is, is as a result of all of that work from the Jamaican community who came and lifted this thing up. Um, very, it was a unique experience, you know? There's no, there's, I've never shot a film like that. Um, and maybe won't again. And so I really enjoyed it. It was the most tiring and but stimulating, you know, shoot that I've ever had. Um, you couldn't do that all year, but every year. But for that slice of time, it was appropriate, and, and I'm glad I got to do it. Uh, and from a, a musical standpoint, uh, like I, I know uh, his uh, vocals were sort of combined with yours uh, in, in, in the film. Uh, what was it like kind of singing his, his work and, and kind of getting to know the character through his music? That was amazing, really, because I don't sing and I don't play the guitar, and I love music. And I got to spend many, many months listening to him and, and talking about music with experts. And I think even separate to the film, like I, find, I just find that really interesting. Um, Ziggy and the family, they're musicians, they're creative. So we were able to have, like they, you know, I would talk to them about acting and they would talk to me about music and there was kind of a universal language that we had different ways of expressing it. And uh, the singing to me was, a journey. I was scared. There was never any real pressure. They all told me from the beginning, you don't need to play, we can just cheat it. But I wanted to learn how to play because I was like, I want to feel what this feels like. I want to, I want to understand. Bob had a guitar in his hand every day of his life, you know, from when he was, you know, 13. That's what he did every day. He woke up, he played the guitar. He was up at three in the morning sometime, up till three in the morning, then up at six playing the guitar. So I wanted to understand what that felt like. And also to sing is to feel, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a vulnerable thing. Um, so I just wanted to try and connect with Bob in that way. Um, chords are just something you have to practice. Bob, interestingly, Bob and I are very different physically and vocally. Uh, we have no physical similarities in any way really, apart from sharing, well, you know, we have a mixed background, you have one parent who's of color and one who's white. Other than that, we're not physically the same. My voice is a lot deeper than Bob's. So it was really, it was a really interesting sort of giving over to the idea that we really had to just trust in the essence and focusing on trying to connect with Bob's spirit because they didn't have really anything else for free. You know, look or sound like, you know, there's some people who are carbon copies of the people who they are playing. So they have that part of it for free, whereas I had none of that for free. Um, so we really had to focus on the essence. 
the rhythm of language, the specificity of patois. And luckily for me, when Bob rehearsed, when Bob was you know, writing songs in his room, he tuned the guitar down, not to blow out his voice. So he composed in a B, I think, a tone down. And I was able to handle singing in a tone down. It wouldn't destroy my voice. I couldn't sing, I could only keep up with him so much in the recorded stuff. So in the bedroom, when Lashana comes in and we're doing Turn Your Lights Down Low, and that's me. When we go down to uh, create Exodus in the room, that's my voice. And it wasn't planned. They were gonna, Stephen or Ziggy were gonna dub over. But I think the family and Ray and everyone decided that it would be better just to keep my voice in. So that was a surprise to me. And it just made me feel grateful that I had done all of those months of working on singing and playing the guitar because I was like, I actually got there and was just by the skin of my teeth, like able to do it. Um, it's different when you're practicing at home. As soon as you come onto a set and there's people watching you, it's, in, it's incredible how much of it disappears. Um, so it took a lot, lot of help. And Ziggy was always there with the music. He was there all the time, but he, especially with the music, he was always there to help. And he would come in and bring me down and give me notes and say a little bit more like this and a little bit more like that and less. It was always less, 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 do less, do less, do less. Loose, 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 do less. And so when you got Bob Marley's son telling you that, it, you know, you feel like you're in safe hands. Um, but I loved the music part of it. I loved the music. I loved studying his music. I loved learning about how the albums, you know, over that 10 year period, like which ones came first, which was second. It was an education for me. We know all the, fa I know all the famous Bob stuff, but I didn't really have a, an encyclopedic knowledge of him and his history in, in, in terms of the music. Um, Rust the Man Vibration, Exodus into, all, you know, Concrete Jungle, when they came specifically in the period of time, what led him to Exodus and then what came afterwards. That was actually really fascinating background work normally backstory can be tedious um and just feel like you're finding out a lot of information but i found the, the musical aspect was a treat really um and yeah i imagined uh hair makeup and costumes must have also really helped uh get into the mindset of, of the character like when you look at yourself in the mirror and and you know you, you look more like bob marley like as you're playing him in the film what is you know, how, how does that help you in your process? Yeah, it's great. You just have to be really specific. I think as well, there was a, like technically speaking, there was a, a we were, I felt it was really important to concentrate on not accentuating the upper body. So, you know, there's lots of iconic images of Bob wearing quite tight fitted t-shirts, whereas I didn't want to do that because it, you hug close to my upper body on camera that it sort of feels more expansive. Um, no matter how much weight I lose my shoulder width, you know, can only shrink so much. Um, so I was really interested in looser at the top. And so we had to find lots of images of Bob in clothes that were loose fitting. And there were many, 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 many. But some of his iconic, some of the most iconic outfits, you know, are quite hugged. So it was about building them out a little bit. And, you know, um, but the costumes were great. The jeans, I loved the flares. I never thought I'd enjoy wearing flares so much they were such an important part of style at that time and he was a really stylish guy bob was really stylish because he didn't put that much energy into it he wore what he liked and he flung it on um it's amazing how cool some of that stuff still is now um and yeah in terms of hair and makeup there was a version of the film where i was like i don't want any prosthetics i don't want any teeth i just want to well, they asked me to try some stuff so we tried three or four different versions and there was a a subtle tip that was put on the nose just to kind of slightly straighten my nose to make it more European, which was Bob's nose, which I really liked. It, was, it wasn't intrusive, but it just on camera, it just gave a different thing. And then there were some teeth that went in because Bob had really big, white, clean teeth in that smile. And I put them on and I was like, Do you know what, this feels good. So it feels good, it's like, it's not me, it's Bob, you know? So like this, I think helps. Um, usually I'm really opposed to that because essence is about essence, it's not about prosthetics. But I think with Malcolm, I had said none, you know? They put a nose and some teeth on me and I was like, there is no way on earth 
and playing this part with that. But with this, it was different. I think maybe, maybe sort of a maturity from my end, going lots of different things help. But also, I think on on Malcolm the prosthetics they were hindering the performance. Like the teeth were cut in my mouth, and the nose just felt desperately uncomfortable. Whereas with Bob, they felt really. They felt loose. The teeth were soft. Sometimes I'd forget they were in my mouth. I'd go to sleep with them, you know. Um, and I tried to wear the teeth. I was wearing the teeth a couple of months before we started shooting because you need to get used to talking with them in. So I would forget they were in a lot of the time. Um, and then, yeah. And then the hair was the hair. Uh, my outlet, Gold Derby, is an awards uh, website. So I have to ask about that iconic awards moment that you had earlier this year performing, you know, as part of that I'm Just Ken uh, 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 performance at the Oscars earlier this year with Ryan Gosling. What did you think when you were approached for that? And uh, was it like a surreal experience to perform that on stage? Well, I'll tell you what. It was Ryan's idea, and he called us. And he said, can you guys fly out? Because I want you to be involved in this. And I just thought it was such a representation of what a brilliant person he is and what a great leading man he was on that set, and Margot as well. Um, so we flew out the day before and we had a couple of hours rehearsal and we got to walk in to see what he'd been doing for the last couple of weeks and it was mind blowing, you know, and he was very involved in the direction and the choreography, like he had a huge input into that and we just sort of got involved in and learnt what we could. Um, but going out on the night, I was like, what the hell are we doing? This is insane. Because you can see, you can literally see Scorsese and Spielberg right there in front of you. But I felt like it was such a, it was a nice bit of light fun. Uh, and uh, it went down really well in the night. And um, yeah, I loved that. I loved being a part of that movie. And it was so much fun and to do comedy for the first time. Uh, yeah, it left me with a really good feeling. And that was a nice way to, to wrap it all up and celebrate the movie. Well, I want to congratulate you on uh, on Bob Marley, One Love, and, uh, you know, I'm just Ken, Barbie, all your work up to this point, and, you know, more work to come in the future, I'm sure. Thank uh, you, bro. Thank you so much for talking with me. It's been a pleasure. No, likewise, man. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.